Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for joining today. We would like to invite you to day five of uh, FinTech Tour 20, the largest cluster of FinTech events to happen in the Middle East. Uh, my name is Sagar Shah and I'm part of the FinTech Saudi team. We're really pleased today to be joined by Daniel Libo. He is um, the founder of Lightbulb Cap Capital, which was founded in 2014 to help uh, realize the potential of innovation and novel technologies to transform financial services. Dan has also been appointed as the affiliate faculty of Singapore Management University for innovation in finance, fintech, blockchain, and digital assets. He's also a visiting professor at IE Business School, teaching fintech business models and valuation, uh, a top rank master's program. And he's also a frequent uh, speaker in seminars on blockchain and innovation and financial services. We should also add that Dan is also the trainer for the SMU executive course for uh, FinTech Innovation and Data, which FinTech Saudi has uh, been hosting in the kingdom twice this year. I had the pleasure of attending one of those courses and found uh, Dan to be one of the most insightful uh, trainers uh, to, tra to teach on FinTech. So we were thrilled when he agreed to give a guest note during the FinTech tour on FinTech in uh, financial markets. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this lunchtime session. Uh, feel free to add any Q&A in the Q&A box or introduce yourself in the chat box. We'll, 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 we'll go through questions at the end. Um, and if you if, if you need anything else, then, then just feel free to write in the chat box. And on that note, I'll hand it over to Dan uh, and we'll have a great lecture on FinTech in financial markets. Thanks, Dan. Thank, thank you, Saga. Thank you guys for having me. It's a great pleasure to be back in the kingdom, even though it's just virtual. So I say hi from Singapore and um, it's, it's a real great pleasure to um, take part in the FinTech tour in 2020. So let me just see whether I can share my screen. All right, can everyone see, Saga, can you see my screen? Uh, yep, screens. Yeah, screens okay, there. excellent. All right, so so um, I guess what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about fintech in financial markets because people often focus on retail and payments, and then uh, I feel like sometimes financial markets is the 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 little brother that nobody looks at, but then in the end of the day, the tickets are much bigger in financial markets. So the, so this space also deserves some of our attention. I think I don't have to uh, introduce myself uh, at length. Um, maybe the one thing I would add to Saga's kind introduction is that I also used to work in banking for 15 years uh, before I became a, a part-time professor and consultant. So um, I kind of empathize with the challenges um, that the industry has because I've been in it for a very long time. So don't expect me to be some visionary kind of person who doesn't see the issues that you might have if you work for a financial services company because I've I felt the pain for a very long time myself as well. All right, this is the agenda for today. Um, first, um, I want to talk to you for a few minutes only on our SMU executive course in FinTech Innovation and Data. Uh, Saga mentioned we, we ran it twice in the Kingdom um, this year, and I think it was, a, it was a, at least for me, it was an amazing experience because I got to meet so many nice people, so that, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, so I'll walk you through what a, an example kind of structure of this course looks like. Um, then we really want to focus on fintech and financial markets. And I thought I want to touch on three basic ideas, right? The first one is really how business model innovation can change how financial markets information and transaction flow works. And I'll, I'll have a little case study on that. Then I want to introduce to you the concept of blockchain briefly and also share what an application in blockchain is that is, is very uh, interesting from a financial markets perspective. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit about data science and um, how data science is really transforming some of the secondary market trading activities that are going on in, in the markets. And then we can conclude and basically have a bit of time left for uh, questions and answers. But that doesn't mean that you cannot Answer, ask your questions in between the session, right? So if there's something that you want to drill in deeper, then please feel free to put them in our, in our Q&A box and I will try to respond to that. 
Also, I apologize up front if I happen to um, not see your question. Please don't um, hesitate to uh, ask it again once we're done with the session towards the end of our, of our guest lecture, OK? All right. Now, just a brief overview of our class, right, in case you're interested. So we discuss uh, on day one basically what is innovation and how we can become better at identifying novel ideas for innovation in financial services. Um, we then spend the afternoon in really discussing what the different business models are that exist in the world of fintech. Um, in our course, obviously, at greater length than today, uh, we also have a guest speaker that introduces some of these interesting business models and how they were deployed in China. Because um, as you know, there's, there's lots uh, of fintech going on in China. On day two, we really uh, zoom in a little bit more on how data, AI, and um, machine learning in finance is being used and how it should be used properly. Um, we also have a guest speaker uh, that talks about the economics of machine learning and data science in the context of insurance, very interesting. And um, even though uh, at times a little bit challenging for some participants, I think there's a little section on how to use the Python programming language. Um, but obviously, we keep that relatively short. And um, if you wanted to dive into that deeper, then obviously, we, we give you all the resources to do that after our class. On day three, we discuss blockchain technology and also um, introduce perhaps somebody who's uh, in the, the payment space uh, to share a little bit more about that part of the, uh, the fintech ecosystem. Um, and then there's a whole exercise around how to use blockchain in the world of financial services, right? Because blockchain is way bigger than just cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Uh, that is perhaps one thing, but then also you can, you can really use it for many other uh, purposes and, and optimize your, your flows. Um, we also talk about how to govern or how to manage innovation in a large financial services firm where perhaps the culture is very risk averse, but then for innovation, we need all of this creativity, right? So you can see how that clashes sometimes. And we try to um, give you from some practical hints on how to make innovation happen in your company. One of the tools that we really like to make innovation happen is a tool called design thinking. It's, it's actually more a methodology than a tool. So we spend some time on day three, some time on day four on that. And we basically conclude the program with a, an activity where you absorb all of the insights that you have gotten from the, the three and a half days before. And you basically put together a plan on how to do something innovative in your company. And um, then uh, participants usually present and we graduate and we wrap up, right? So you can tell it's... Um, it's four days uh, of action-packed fintech content. Um, some people probably, uh, you know, want to take a day off after it because it's quite intense. But I also think that it's, a, it's very much um, a fun session where people from different companies, different backgrounds, from the regulator come together and try to work on fintech um, as a group. So um, if that is of interest to you, please let uh, Saga and the fintech team know because it's, um, it's quite an exciting um, class that we're planning to run again in 2021. Okay, enough uh, of the advertising. Let's talk about fintech uh, and how it applies in financial markets. So I want to say two things to the, in the beginning, right? If we talk about innovation finance, I really like Robert Schiller's definition of what finance is. And you can see how the two, innovation and finance, are related. Finance, he says, is like engineering, and it's all about devices that solve people's problems or help them manage risks, let them do things and get on with their purposes. And also, it has a human element to it. Right? So I really like that definition of finance, because you can see how you can replace the word finance with innovation. It's quite similar. What's the definition of innovation? Um, and, and you know, if you attend my class, I'll, I'll <laughs> repeat this over and over again. Innovation is really the creation of new value. And that means that it's more than an invention. An invention is something new, doesn't necessarily create new value, but it's also something different to just an existing and successful business. 
because you can do something that is hundreds of years old and that still works, right? So that is the combination of the two. A business that is successful creates new value um, and then also is based on something that is brand new. Now, um, how do fintech companies and traditional uh, companies differ? Um, obviously, they're different in size. Fintech companies are often smaller, right? Um, in, in the case of larger companies, often agency issues exist because um, these large companies are basically um, serving so many different customers that you can't avoid these agency issues, where sometimes smaller um, fintech companies can really zoom in on doing one thing very well. Um, culturally, they're also different, right? Quite risk averse, perhaps, in, in the case of larger firms, but then very entrepreneurial in the fintech case. And um, the client focus is also different, right? Because uh, larger firms are basically used to have client flow because you know, you're a regulated entity. Where, where else will people go? Whereas fintech startups sometimes really focus on how to gain traction, how to gain market share. Um, ethically, perhaps not so different, actually. Yeah, that's why I put it put it in red over here, you can see, right? Because there are also black sheep in the FinTech community. So that is actually something that, um, yeah, transpired uh, over the past few years. In the beginning, we were probably all a little bit more naive, or at least I was. And then from a budgetary perspective, also quite different, right? Because while large companies have larger absolute amounts of money to spend on um, their operation, probably the part of the budget that is spent on creating something novel, on doing innovation, is much bigger in a fintech company. So with all of that in mind, let's move on and talk a little bit about what a business model actually is. A business model is really, and this is, I'm borrowing a description here by Alex Osterwalder, who is the business model person who developed the business model canvas. He says, a business model describes the rationale of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And um, it sounds like a bit of a management sentence, management consultant sentence, but um, let's, let's um, unpick that a little bit, okay? So first of all, if you are building a new business model, what do you have to do? You have to figure out who is your customer. So you know your customer segment, then you create value somehow. Right? You, you create something that probably the customer is interested in. And then you deliver that value, right? You have to get, in this case, the ice cream um, all the way to the, to the beach, right? But that's not where it ends, actually. You have to do one more thing. You have to also capture the value for, for yourself, right? Because if you don't capture the value, it's not innovative, right? You're not going to create value for yourself. So that's a very uh, basic uh, explanation of what a business model is. Now, you remember how um, the brokerage um, business model works in traditional markets, right? So usually what you have is um, investment banks that love to put themselves in the middle, and then you have fund managers and corporations. Corporations need capital. Institutions are willing to buy um, shares, and then eventually they go and trade on an exchange. And um, why is that business uh, interesting? Basically, investment banks distribute investment research for free to their institutional buy side clients. And then they get paid in a, on a fee basis, right? When, when investors want to trade the stocks of corporations on an exchange. So you can see how this, is, this process is very prone to agency issues, right? Because if I'm an investment bank, what am I gonna do? Of course, I'm gonna send the relevant investment research to my buy side clients that incentivizes them or entices them to trade, right? Because if they don't trade, I don't make any money. So am I always acting in the best interest of my client? Well, that's kind of not always the case, right? So, so here is how I want to share with you a little bit about how FinTech is really changing business models in capital markets, right? And um, I want to talk a little bit about this company called Smart Karma. And Smart Karma is this company that effectively 
um, created a proposition that is very similar to Spotify. I'm sure you're all familiar with Spotify. How does Spotify work? You pay $10 a month and you can listen to all the music that exists on the Spotify platform. Now, think about Smart Karma as the Spotify of investment research. For a flat fee, you can have access to all the research that exists on the Smart Karma platform. If you're an investment fund, that might be quite attractive for you. Why? Because the investment bank will not cherry pick the pieces of research that they think will entice you to trade as a fund manager, right? In fact, trading is a completely separate um, business line. Smart Karma doesn't even offer any type of execution services. All they do is really be the Spotify for investment research. So remember how we discussed that agency issues sometimes create issues in our traditional finance world. Smart Karma basically removed one of these agency issues by unbundling research from the um, execution and trading capability. Yeah. So th this is a really nice um, example on how business model innovation can um, uh, make, make great progress and inwards into the financial markets. And, um, Therefore, it's not surprising that, you know, top VC firms like, for example, Sequoia have invested in Smart Karma because they see the, um, the opportunity in that space. Okay. I'm looking a little bit at the clock and I realize, wow, there's so much more material that I want to share with you. But um, I also want to pause for a moment and see, are there any questions that we should perhaps um, discuss at this moment. I have to admit that I'm not very good with using the Q&A box, but I see no open questions at this moment. Maybe Saga or uh, anyone from the team can help me out and, and confirm whether that's the case. No, no, not, not right. Not right now. I think um, if we continue and then at the end, we can we can spend the last 10 minutes sort of getting go, going through the questions. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. So this was my, my brief example on business model innovation in capital markets. And um, what I want to show you next, let me see. Oh yeah, look, this is, a, this is a, an example that I had. Um, I actually was once a research provider on Smart Karma. So I um, wrote a little piece on investing in innovation and how to do that. And then uh, fund managers could basically read that piece and um, then decide what to, what to do with that new insight that they got. So uh, quite, a, quite an interesting way to crowdsource some of these investment research pieces from a larger community of analysts. All right. Now, what's blockchain? That is my, that is my next topic, really. And um, let's see. This is a definition or a list of definitions for you on what blockchain is. And I'll start from the bottom, actually. Uh, one definition, the actual technology of blockchain combines mathematical cryptography, open source software, computer networks, and incentive mechanisms. And uh, De Filippi is, a, is a, a lawyer. So this is one uh, definition that they use. Uh, David Jermak is a, is a scholar in finance at NYU. He says, blockchain records data in, in a sequential archive. And then we've got one more. Uh, definition that says blockchain is able to some degree to replace trust in platform systems. But actually the definition that I like the best for blockchain, because it's very long and all encompassing, okay, is the first one. The first one says a peer to peer distributed ledger that is cryptographically secure, append only, immutable and updatable only via consensus or agreement amongst peers. Now that's quite a mouthful, right? So what I'm gonna try and do next is explain a little bit more what that actually means, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check my next slide. Oh no, actually, I'm gonna talk about it here. So if you think about what peer-to-peer -peer means, it means that two entities can really do business together without the need of an intermediary that will charge them and present some sort of risk, right? And a distributed ledger means that the ledger is um, stored many times uh, on many different computers so that tampering with that ledger is close to impossible. 
um, probably none of us is a cryptographer or perhaps one or two are, and um, I'm not, <laughs> but basically the concept of blockchain uses cryptography to secure this immutability that we also talk about here, right? Immutability means um, you can't tamper with the blockchain. You can only add records as you go. And um, that's what we mean by append only. And what is consensus? Well, consensus really means that many actors on this blockchain network need to agree what the real truth is, and then only true and legitimate transactions can be added to the blockchain. Okay, so um, so if you think about all of that, is is blockchain is basically not a brand new concept, but more a a combination of existing Lego blocks. Um, I remember that IBM, I think, filed a um, filed a patent in 1976, as early as 1976, to uh, do what David Jermak uh, uses as a definition, the blockchaining of data, okay? And um, that's why it's so exciting, because it really combines some of the most uh, interesting pieces of technology and assembles it in a way that create a lot of value or can create a lot of value depending on how you use that technology going forward. And because our session today is really about financial markets, I wanted to share how blockchain technology can be used in the context of securities markets. Okay. So what's very encouraging is um, that the current chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US made this statement. He said, perhaps all stocks could become blockchain tokens. You can imagine how the, the blockchain community reacted to that, right? They are very, very excited about this. But um, it is actually interesting that somebody as senior and as, um, as uh, a critical of blockchain basically comes out with a statement like this. Now, let's see what we can do with uh, blockchain capital markets. Basically, what we can do is we can issue securities on top of blockchain, right? And um, I want to share a little bit about the research that um, I have done with my two co-authors, uh, Thomas and Peter. Um, we realized that there's a lot of research about ICOs and cryptocurrencies, but less so about security token offerings, uh, regulated financial products. And what we do in our, in our paper that we've written on that topic is basically to understand some basic facts around security token markets. And also um, we highlight some success factors that can basically help security issuers uh, do the right things if they want to be successful with their funding round. Um, some of the key insights, uh, security tokens are in fact different to initial coin offerings, right? And they're not a subset of them. Um, also, uh, we find that STO activity really developed after initial coin offering uh, market bubble imploded. Uh, of course, it's an early stage market and a very nascent market, but um, it's exciting to see how, especially in the last few months, we see a lot of activity of um, different um, market participants that are exploring how to use blockchain for securities. Um, another insight is STOs are basically being issued all over the world, but there's some key jurisdictions that are um, very relevant in this context. Um, also, what we find is, and this is to no surprise anyone who reads uh, corporate finance literature, if you uh, have your governance in order and you uh, empower your shareholders, for example, to take decisions with you through uh, imparting voting rights, then that has a positive impact on your funding success. All right, let's move on. Uh, I quickly want to spend a few minutes on really distinguishing for you what is a security token and what are all of these other things that exist on blockchain to make it very clear, okay? So basically what we have here is we have, we're looking at the, uh, a description and then what um, the product is really used for and how it is looked at from an accounting perspective. Because I think that makes it most clear um, that these, these uh, three types of tokens are really different. So 
while a security token is basically a representation of an investment product, a utility token is much more akin to a voucher or as uh, Howell define it, um, a consumptive right to access a product or a service, okay? Um, and then obviously a payment token is more akin to, to cash on, on blockchain. Now, if you think about the purpose of these different tokens, this is what we're trying to define when we look at the use um, uh, line item here, right? So security tokens being investment products obviously are bought with the expectation of profit. But then utility tokens, even though you don't believe it, or you know, there are many different views, basically are issued to enable token holders to spend them in an ecosystem and not, they're not there for speculating speculation or for investment. And then payment tokens, obviously, as the name suggests, are there to pay. Lastly, how do we look at this, these different types of tokens from an accounting perspective? Well, securities um, are a financing instrument, right? So they're on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And uh, we probably would categorize them under equity or, or some other term of long-term liability, depending on the permutation of that security token versus utility token, they're very different. They are considered revenue, right? And they, they end up on your income statement. And even if we look at them in a, in a financing kind of way, they are at best working capital, right? So they're short-term liability. So you can see how there's very clear distinction between uh, how an accountant would look, like at, would look at in terms of utility tokens and security tokens. All right, um, this is a, a rather complex slide uh, that shows the process of how a security token offering really works. Um, but what I would like to only add here is that it basically is the, a small man's IPO, if you like. And one additional step that it, um, that it really encompasses is that there is some time spent on selecting the right technology providers. Because if you uh, do a normal public offering, um, or even a private placement, you know, technology is not that important. But now that we're issuing these products on blockchain, you need to spend a little bit of time on making sure that the right technology providers are, are selected. If this is a topic of interest to you, then um, I will refer to further ma reading materials uh, in, a, in a moment, or always feel, feel free to, you know, to reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll happily help you out. I'm quite passionate about this, this topic. All right, so different types of securities. We have all sorts of different types that exist in the normal world as well, right? So why would it be different on blockchain? We have debt, equity, and funds. Uh, we have a small uh, group of in other investment tokens that were difficult to categorize. And then perhaps what's a little bit novel is we do have income share tokens. So tokens that basically um, and give you the right to participate in either a certain percentage of sales or a certain percentage of net profit. And you can see there's around a third of them that fall into this category. Very interesting. Um, as I mentioned before, if you are very keen to understand more, um, there's a full paper that we have written. There's also a shorter version published on the Oxford Business Law blog entitled The Nascent Primary Market of Security Tokens. And um, Hong Kong, the Chinese University of Hong Kong has also um, published a post that we put together on how the future of these security tokens, or we call them native digital securities, are going to look like. So if that's something interested to you, we can share the links uh, later or, or you know, publish them on a, on a website for your reference. Um, on the topic of digital assets and security tokens, this is the kind of profile that we bring into our class uh, that we ran twice last year, right? So Alice is a, is a very experienced lawyer and founder of a marketplace for digital securities. So this is something that I really like about our class. 
we basically talk about the theory, we talk about the concepts, we talk about some practical examples, and eventually we bring somebody into the class that says, hey, I'm running this kind of fintech business. Here's, here's how I look at the world, and here's why I disagree with Daniel, and here's um, how, how regulation moves and so on. So I think this is, a, this is a quite an exciting part of the class that we run. All right, now, any questions before we move on into the data science field um, on the topic of blockchains? Please, uh, I, let me see, there's one question. We've, actually. Got, we've oh. got one question here, Dan, is, is there any FinTech company that uses blockchain in its trading? If yes, how exactly in what field? Okay, excellent. Very good question, um, Nora, thank you for that. Um, I think there are many companies that are now um, involved in the trading process of digital assets. And I think we have to distinguish between cryptocurrency trading and then also the trading of securities, right? So on the security side, um, broadly speaking, we have the marketplaces, for example, um, one company is called Investor X. That's the one that um, uh, you know Alice is running. Um, but then we have also companies that are um, basically funds that um, issue their fund instrument as a security token for institutional investors to hold on to it um, on a blockchain basis. Um, what else is there? There are also custodians, obviously, because these. Um, these digital assets need to be custodized somehow. So we have an uh, emerging number of custody companies. One of them is perhaps Hex Trust in, um, in Hong Kong. Another big one in the US is called Coinbase. Um, and then obviously we have all of the um, you know, liquidity provision type of companies, the likes of jump trading, um, uh, what else, Susquehanna probably, um, flow traders that make markets in these digital asset products. So it's it's quite a booming sector actually, and um, we are investigating that um, on behalf of one of our clients actually as as we speak. So very exciting topic, and I know Nora that um, you know maybe my answer is a little bit shortcut, but um, if you want to discuss that at more length, then please feel free to reach out on me. Uh, reach, out, reach out to me. I have a. Um, I have a link to my LinkedIn profile at the end of the session. So I hope to hear from you more. All right. That is, that is basically the shot of it around blockchain. What I want to talk about next is, a, is another very exciting topic, and that is really how data science and machine learning affect financial markets today. Okay. And um, I will show these, this slide, right? And I try to elaborate a little bit with, with participants in the program what these two lines that we can see on the graph on the right hand side might mean, right? Uh, but I'll cut it short for you today. So um, basically, the blue line is the total amount of data in the world that cannot be understood by computers. And the red line is the opposite, is all of the data in the world that can be understood by computers or processed by computers. And if you look at that chart, it suddenly becomes very clear that if you're a financial services company and you're not good with data, you're gonna lose out, right? Because they're very interesting two points on this slide. The first one, I hope you can see my mouse, is around 2014 and 15, where for the first time, there was more data in the world that computers could process than data that they couldn't. And then, you know, in right now, basically 2020, we can see that this number or this, this amount of data that is not processable by computers diminishes, right? Goes down. And at the same time, we have this exponential curve in data that is being processed by computers or can be processed by computers. So if you're a financial services organization, whether you're a fund or a bank or insurance company, you know, and you have competition and your competitor is good in data and you're not, then who's going to win, right? It's quite obvious that the, the, the future financial services firm has to be very proficient when it comes to using data and extracting data um, or extracting insights from data, rather. All right? Now, 
what's AI? Uh, you know, lots of people use the word AI all the time, uh, maybe a little bit misunderstood sometimes. Uh, this, so I looked it up for you in the, in the dictionary. A branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. That's the, the definition of this umbrella term called AI, okay? And um, we basically uh, want to look a little bit more into machine learning. And machine learning is one branch of AI that deals with the ability of a computer to learn from data that it sees. And what can a computer do? Or what can we, what kind of value can we create on the back of this capability of machine learning? We can basically use it for two different things, right? We can interpret data and try to understand the world better. That's what we say, that works, that's what we mean here by interpretation. Then we can also use it to make predictions, right? Because if we understand the, the, the current uh, um, frame of things very well, um, then we can also say, okay, perhaps we can look a little bit into the future and based on everything that we know and correlations that we have, this, uh, that we have found, we can, we can perhaps make a best guess, a probabilistic best guess on what the future is going to hold for us. Um, there are different types of machine learning, again. Um, one is really dealing with classification. So basically, the, the prediction, if you like, is an outcome, uh, is, a, is a category, you know. Um, is my customer uh, male or female? That could be a classification type of a machine learning program. But then also, we have a whole uh, branch of it that is perhaps more akin to regression, which basically suggests that the outcome is continuous or is a, is a particular number, right? Um, what is the most likely spend um, of a particular customer or what is the uh, stock price going to do tomorrow? These are regression type problems. So it's important to understand that there are these two different types, uh, classification and regression. Um, one thing that is very uh, often uh, used in the space of machine learning is a confusion matrix. And if we were in our four day class, I will talk to you at length about the confusion matrix. But I want to make sure that you have seen this confusion matrix, even though we only have an hour to talk about, it, because it's very important to understand that any prediction can basically fall into these two, uh, four categories, right? So you can identify something properly that is a true positive. You can, under, uh, you can identify something as a negative that is really a negative. So that's your true negative. But then the two opposing ends also exist, right? So you can predict something as false that is in fact true, and you can and predict something that is uh, true that is in fact false. So to understand um, the outputs of a uh, learning algorithm, you want to calculate some of these um, uh, par um, uh, ratios basically to make sure that you don't only focus on one of them maybe you know people who haven't looked at machine learning so much they always go for precision and they, they want to know okay uh, how much did i get right right but that's only half of the truth so i would invite you to join my class and explore this concept a little bit more um, if if data is a big deal in your kind of context now, I want to quickly introduce to you the five milestones of AI in financial markets, because in the end of the day, this is a session about how data and uh, AI is being used in the financial markets. So let me start out with the introduction to Jim Simmons. Jim Simmons is um, one of the first um, quantitative um, traders that founded a company called Renaissance Technologies in 1982. And they really kicked off this whole idea of using machine learning methods to trade in the markets. And there's a really entertaining book, if you have time and appetite, written by uh, Greg Zuckerman that basically describes his whole entrepreneurial career. What I find fascinating, right, about Jim Simmons is that he didn't have cloud computing. 
he didn't have super powerful computers that fit into his pocket, right, as an iPhone. In 1982, machine learning was a whole big different deal, right? And the amount of data available, you can imagine, was also very small. So um, the one statement that really stuck with me is, uh, it's, I think it's in the book, he says, to be, a successful, to be successful in the markets, you only have to be right 50.75%. And so if sometimes uh, people say, oh, my machine learning algorithm um, is 99% accurate and you know, takes the right trading decisions all the time, I'd be very wary, right? Because here's the person who has the most experience in this field and you know, is, is clearly a billionaire. Um, you know, and he says 50.75% is enough to make a very good living, right? So something to ponder on. All right, what's the second milestone? The second milestone is really the idea of using alternative data for um, your um, you know, market valuation and trading and execution kind of activity. And um, the most famous example, I suppose, is the use of satellite imagery to predict the sales of Walmart. Uh, some of you might have heard of this, this story. Basically, people started looking at the car parks in front of Walmart. And if they saw that on the satellite image, there's very few cars, then probably the, the, the next, the quarterly numbers would be quite weak. And if car parks were full, then everything looked fantastic for Walmart, right? And you could trade on, based on that information because that information is available before the financial statements come out. Right, and information advantage obviously translates into a profit opportunity. So by now, fast forward, um, there are plenty of companies that are sourcing data from all different parts, you know, whether it's online or offline data, and they try to make sense of them so that financial markets practitioners can use them. One company that does that quite successful is a company called Blue Fire. Basically, Blue Fire is a specialist in um, supporting buy side managers understand the risk of particular companies better, and they do that by um, scraping the web, you know, looking through all sorts of um, uh, forums, for example, uh, which is very relevant in a context of, for example, China, where a lot of information is not in the price yet. And then they create a type of a warning system for financial markets um, or portfolio management professionals to understand um, the, the riskiness of their holdings better. Quite exciting. So alternative data, data that is not found in the financial reports is, is basically the second milestone. The third thing that happened is actually a person and what is very interesting to hear, apart from what I'm going to tell you in a second, is that Marcos Lopez, the person that we're talking about, has now um, taken a job in the Middle East. I don't know whether you knew that, but he moved to UAE to, to become the head of research and development in Adia. Adia is the big sovereign wealth fund of the, of the United um, Arabic Emirates. And what he's basically done with his publications is to help industry professionals learn how to use machine learning in finance. So this is a very interesting development. Why? Because in the past, if you wanted to apply anything that has to do with machine learning in finance, you need a big group of PhDs that basically do nothing else than you know, geeky development. And now, through his publications, there's a whole tool set or toolbox on how to use machine learning techniques to improve on your financial markets and portfolio management capability. So I highly recommend to read the books. They're quite technical. I would, uh, I would, I would give you that. But um, you know, there, there's some really groundbreaking um, procedural information in there that, um, that would be very interesting for you to absorb. All right, what else? Well, very prominent academic paper is my number four on the list of five. And that paper is, a, is an empirical paper that looks at how companies fare um, 
the ones that use machine learning, the ones that don't use machine learning. And the one insight of this paper is that if financial markets professionals use machine learning, they will be able to understand and describe expected returns of assets better than the ones who don't. And that's quite groundbreaking because if you think about that for a moment, it basically means that anyone who uses machine learning will have an unfair advantage with their, compet their competitors that don't use machine learning. So if you're in uh, fund management, I would highly recommend to look into how to leverage machine learning uh, to um, create the best results for your clients. Lastly, um, new institute, institute uh, um, appeared uh, in 2019, the Financial Data Professional Certification is their certification that they put out there. Really good um, curriculum um, combined with a self-study uh, platform called DataCamp, where you can learn the ins and outs of Python. So you can really see how the, the key capabilities to use machine learning and finance are getting democratized. You know, maybe you don't need a PhD anymore. You don't need to even hire them. You just need somebody who can understand some of these uh, models and then basically dive deep as they work uh, in your organization. I briefly, and I'm very conscious of time, uh, want to talk about ethics in financial markets because with my co-author Tiffany Wong, I have contributed a ch book chapter to this book called the AI book. Our chapter is entitled AI and business ethics in financial markets. And it basically talks a little bit about, um, I'm gonna brush over this actually. It's gonna talk, it talks a little bit about how to operationalize some of the ethical principles that um, we list here on the slide. Fairness, privacy, transparency, explainability, and accountability. All very big words, if you think about it, but actually very little operationalization guidance from the regulators that want you to implement these principles. So where our contribution stands is basically to say, okay, you gotta act fair. Well, in the context of financial markets and machine learning, this is the kind of uh, information or stuff that you need to think through um, if you're running a trading floor. All right. And with that, basically, I want to wrap up, except for, oh, yeah, we, you know, another guest lecture uh, in the context of, of um, machine learning and markets is actually the founder of Proofire, the company I talked about earlier. So you get these sort of international experts in our class that can share their, their great experiences. And with that, yeah, I wanted to um, take a few minutes to perhaps answer any questions um, that you guys might have. I hope that you enjoyed the session a little bit, but I'm also very keen to hear some of the some of the questions that you might have. So just um, just just kicking off. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a that was a really. I know we covered a lot of information in a short amount of time, so everyone's probably still processing some of that. Uh, just one 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 question, which which we have um, often when we talk about capital markets is. With uh, these technologies such as blockchain, AI, all coming together, how do we expect uh, the capital markets to change in the future, especially with quantitative computing coming in as well? Um, do, do you expect there, uh, there to be significant changes in the way the capital markets work and the way that people trade securities, really? Yeah, so, so um, it's interesting, right? Because um, the electronification of capital markets has been going on for quite a while, right? And um, basically, it started out in the, it, it really made significant progress, I think, in the second half of the 90s, where most of the trading activity went from the pit all the way to the computer, right? And then, obviously, there was this whole idea of um, connecting electronically to the exchanges and then connect, connecting to them faster, which got us the whole idea of high frequency trading. Um, and then, yeah, there, there are some uh, microeconomic developments that are quite interesting, right? With the advent of high frequency trading, for example, suddenly you had, you know, had certain market participants that made up 40% of the volume on the German stock exchange, for example, even though it's like a four man band, right? So very, very, not very labor intensive, but then very compute intensive. Um, 
you know, it's uh, high frequency trading highly critically discussed. Some people really disagree with it. In fact, there's a there's a U.S. exchange that built in a circuit breaker of sorts to make sure that everyone is, uh, you know, um, equally treated because that is not always the case in in the in traditional markets. Um, how does quantum computing affect uh, the the markets? I'm not quite sure, but I anticipate that. Uh, things like blockchain will will change markets a lot more because today so many market participants, so many records, so many ledgers, all needs to be reconciled. It's a, one major source of operational risk is reconciliation and getting, you know, basically having this agreement. So if you can use something like blockchain to make sure that there is a distributed ledger that is a unique ledger that could already add um, add a lot of value. I do realize, actually, Saga, that there, that people started chatting me individually. So I want to also spend a little moment Please. to um, answer these questions. Okay, so let me see real quick. Um, is there any questions in here? Uh, okay, so a few folks asking whether we can share the slides. So obviously, we will be able to. I, I assume Saga, right? If I send yeah, them to yeah, you, we can, can put them up. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. And um, oh, and I did talk about my LinkedIn, and I didn't share it yet because here we go. So that was another question that I think somebody had. Uh, uh, everyone, please feel free to kind of connect uh, with me, uh, ask questions. I'm I'm always happy to. Um, be connected with everyone. Then there is a uh, Hitinda that says hi from Bahrain. Hi. Very good to meet you. If there's any specific questions around financial data analytics, then please let me know. Yeah, I think those were the main comments that I can see here now. There, there was one comment around um, if, if somebody had interest in this area, what uh, resources do you would you recommend that they look at? Right. So when we say this area, it's basically fintech and capital markets or because that's quite broad, right? No, so I, I think, think more about the about the, the the use of blockchain in capital markets, the use oh. of AI in capital markets. Oh, okay, okay, got it. So, um, well, if you're interested in how uh, blockchain and securities work, then obviously you can read my paper. <laughs> A little bit of self advertising here, um, but um, I think you know all publications that uh, Marcos Lopez de Palo put out um, on the AI and data science side are very very useful. Um, compared to other uh, publications, they're also relatively readable. That doesn't mean that it's not, it, it can get quite technical, but um, you know, at least uh, in, in all the books, the first chapter is, is understandable by everyone and gives like a nice little overview on how things are developing. So that's a good, that's a good um, starting point, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know, any other questions or comments? Uh, let me see. Oh, here, yeah. Sarah, yeah, is there any regulations or recent graduates? Okay. Um, okay, so if I was a recent graduate of finance, then I think the a couple of things that I would really recommend. So the first one is finance is such a huge space, and you have by now probably also realized that, right? That it, it I mean, there's insurance, there's retail, there's markets. So I always think there's a lot of value in specializing in the area that you're most passionate about. Because yes, uh, you know, many publications suggest we have to be generalists, but I do think it pays off to become specialist first. So pick your pick the area that you're most interested in. And then once you've done that, I think my second recommendation is try to understand how technology impacts that particular area and try to become as tech savvy as you can. Um, in my class, I, I have this slide where I have a logo of Excel and a Python, you know, the, the, the actual animal eating the, the Excel logo. And the reason is really because I think that Python is the new Excel. So even if you're not working in technology department, it's important to be able to manipulate data and to make sense of data. So, so I would really recommend you to, to explore that more. Um, there is another question. Let me see. Interesting session. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, blockchain is difficult to understand. Sure. Um, can I share the link? 
I can share the link and we obviously can connect after. Let me see if I put something onto the chat for everyone. Am I allowed to do that? Let me yeah, see. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, what might be better also, you can put it on the chat, but um, the chat, when, when everyone closes, the chat disappears. So if you send me the link as well, Dan, I can, I can send that around to everyone who's attended. Oh, okay. Okay. Why don't we do that then? That's, that's much better than it. Then we have a, a better record. Okay. And then research topics in fintech or blockchain in AI in the context of the MENA region. Okay, that's an interesting question too. And something that I would say it, I'm not very familiar with is uh, the topic of Islamic finance, I have to admit. But you know, figuring out what the specifics are around how to use blockchain and, and perhaps also um, data and uh, to some extent, also machine learning in the context of Islamic finance, I think could be quite a, an interesting thing to explore uh, from a research perspective. But um, I, I don't know how much work has been done in that space, but I, I assume that especially for blockchain, it has quite big implications. So, so um, Abdul, if you're interested in that, then please keep me um, abreast because I would also be interested to learn more about it. Just to add to that, the Capital Markets Authority have uh, are looking at testing uh, distributed ledger technology as part of the fintech lab. So, um, if if you go to their sites, you'll see some of the companies which are engaged in there, uh, which which are actually experimenting with using uh, distributed ledger technology. Excellent, excellent, very good. Any other questions, comments, anything you disagree with? That's also interesting. If not, as I mentioned earlier, you know, feel free to feel free to connect on LinkedIn, and then I'll I'll be happy to um, try and answer your questions, and hopefully see some of you in the next class, of course, um, because that is always a good good way to kind of explore the topics a lot more in depth, right? Because in one hour, uh, a little bit complicated to cover cover a lot. Absolutely. Oh, there's one more. Uh, are we detailing with? Um, so cryptocurrency. Okay. So in, in class, we do talk a little bit about cryptocurrency, but then we also want to make sure that, you know, that there are very different views on the, on, on, from, from a regulatory angle. And, um, of course we wouldn't encourage anything that is not in line with local regulations. Um, but we do explain the basic concepts for people to understand, um, perhaps similar to my little table that I had today, where we delineate quite clearly, you know, what is a security token, what is a, what is cryptocurrency. So we do cover that a bit. Excellent. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think we've run out of time, Dan. But the, thank time you very up. much for attending. I, I think that was really insightful as always. I think everyone enjoyed. All the participants enjoyed attending the session. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending as well, especially during the, during the lunchtime break. Uh, Fintech Tour will be running until the 10th of December. So if you'd like to hear other great speakers such as Dan, feel free to go to uh, Fintech Saudi's website, www.fintechsaudi.com forward slash tour and register for uh, some great sessions we have this evening. Uh, we've got a session on banking in 2050. Uh, next week, we have several sessions on related to AI and digital assets and, and entrepreneurship skills. So there's a lot of good stuff there. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining uh, on, on this great session. Hopefully we'll get you into the kingdom soon, Dan. Bye-bye from Singapore. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.